We're going to keep going with this uh, lesson series, learning what the Bible says about the kingdom. And this is part two. So it goes along with that handout of 63 different items uh, that I gave you last week, and it's back there if you missed it. Uh, So we started this word study last Sunday night about the kingdom that Jesus Christ came to establish. And we've been looking at exactly what the New Testament says with regards to this kingdom. Daniel 2 and verse 44 foretold in the Old Testament that in the days of the Roman Empire, God himself would set up a kingdom that would never be destroyed. Uh, It would be a kingdom that would stand forever. And as we've been studying, of course, we know that this kingdom is the church, the church of Christ. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus said when he was here, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The very next verse, he says, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus established the church of Christ, which was the kingdom that God had designed and foreordained before the foundation of the world. So when we study this as it's some mystical concept, it's not really. Uh, it, It is the church that we know and love. Uh, so if you remember the foreshadowing of, uh, from the Old Testament, we've been looking at the tabernacle layout, which was symbolic of the kingdom. And in order to enter, we must uh, you know, see from the diagram that you have to have the blood sacrifice, which represents Jesus. You have to have the washing of water, which represents baptism. And then you can enter in, into God's house as God's priests. So there's no other way of entrance. This is a visual uh, for how souls enter the kingdom of God that would be established. That is how you would enter the church of Christ, and you can enter into heaven as part of that kingdom. Note that once in the first compartment called the holy place, uh, there the faithful dwell spiritually in a spiritual condition in the holy place until it is time for them to cross through the veil at their own death, just as Jesus did at his death. So once they pass through this veil, once we pass through the veil, they will enter into the presence of the Father on the other side of the veil, which is death. So the two compartments of the kingdom represent both the saved on earth and the saved in eternity on the other side of the veil. So it's a two-compartment kingdom, I guess you could say. That's why I like the visual. So the only thing about being part of this kingdom now is that we are separated from the second compartment until after we die. We are dwelling, and and, and by the way, that's what we're looking forward to, is the part after we die. This is great, and we're sustained, uh, but you know, if we die in the Lord, we will pass through the veil. Eventually, we'll get to be with God, and that's what being part of this kingdom is all about. So we don't get to enjoy now the full outcome of getting to be part of the kingdom until after we cross over. So the door of this kingdom is found on earth. That's the only way you enter it is here while you're here. And then its structure leads into heaven. So Jesus said, you only access the Father by entering the kingdom. No man comes unto the Father but by me. You must go through what I establish as commanded by my Father. The gates of Hades will not prevail against it. This is the kingdom. And we'll continue to notice that some Bible statements portray the kingdom as dwelling within the church while we're on the earth in the holy place while other statements portray the kingdom as we dwell in it in heaven, which is the most holy place. And uh, so on our item, or on our, our list of 63 items, let's pick up where we left off about this kingdom. We stopped at number 24, so let's pick up on number 25 tonight. We'll keep going. This kingdom, number 25, can be compared to a dragnet that grabs hold of all kinds of creatures of the sea, But then each catch needs to be sorted out as good or bad. Matthew chapter 13, verse 47. Uh, So for those who might not understand this illustration, uh, a dragnet is a big net that is thrown into the water to catch fish. It's not a reel. It's not just a lure or a line. It's a big net. Some of you may have seen the movie Finding Nemo. Um, And in that movie, there's a scene with a dragnet where all the fish get captured. So, you know, maybe you can picture a giant type of net like that. That's what a drag net is. But, you know, when when fishermen uh, out at sea will pull in a ton of fish with one of these giant nets, 
after they catch all this giant catch full of all sorts of things, there is a sorting of everything afterwards. Uh, some fishermen have to spend time separating the seaweed from the fish after the catch. And they trash all the disgusting things and they take the good fish. Other fishermen might have to sort out clams or squid or starfish or just different, whatever kind of sea creatures come up with the catch and they just grab everything. Perhaps there are certain types of fish the fishermen really just don't want, they're not looking for, they're not trying to sell that kind of fish. Or if the fish is dead. Uh, so uh, if, if it's not what the fisherman is fishing for, they toss it aside. And they keep the good fish that they intended to catch. So for many of Jesus' immediate followers in his lifetime who were fishermen, right, this would have been a very valuable uh, and relatable illustration to them that they would be able to use. Say, oh yeah, we do that all the time. Jesus says the kingdom is like sorting items out of your net after you've made a catch. Uh, you sift between the good and the bad. It's a sorting. So here's how the verse reads now that we looked at that. Jesus says again, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that is cast into the sea and it gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. And so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So it is here that we see what Jesus is comparing the separation to. Uh, very similarly to the separation of the wheat from the tares, as we talked about last Sunday night, this illustration compares the judgment day to separating good fish from bad fish. Right? Jesus says this kingdom will really be about a separation of people. Right? Some will be categorized as good and will be kept. Others will be categorized as bad. Those who are faithful and in the kingdom are the good fish. Those wicked and out of the kingdom are the bad fish and will not enter in. Uh, the net in this parable it represents really the whole world being brought before God at the judgment day. So that's the gathering, all, all, all people unto our God. On the, judgment gate, uh, on the judgment day, God will send out his reapers, who are the angels, to gather all men and women of the whole world, uh, living and not living, those who are dead, those who are still here. Everybody will stand before God. Matthew 25, and verse 32 says, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them from one another as a, sheep, uh, as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Verse 41, then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you curse it, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 46 says, these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. So the separation of the good from the bad is what the parable of the dragnet really is referring to. All right, so even some individuals who claim to follow Christ, and even some individuals who attend church services at the Church of Christ and will gather in the number of, of the true Christians who are faithful. The Bible says that at the last day they will be sifted out and they will be categorized for their secret sins for which they refuse to repent, some public sins, and the good and the bad will be separated forever. The parable says, and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So the question is, are you in his kingdom or are you out of his kingdom? Are you good or are you bad? Faithful or unfaithful? That's what Jesus is getting us to think about when he was giving this illustration. Number 26, uh, the treasure enjoyed in this kingdom holds pieces that are both new and old. Matthew chapter 13, verse 52. Now there might be some different uh, ways of looking at this. Perhaps um, you know some of the Old, old time people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, some of those who 
you know, are going to get to enter in, into heaven after this is all over. They're, they might be the old treasure. We might be the new treasure. That might be one interpretation. But let me read this part. So here's the parable. The passage says, Then Jesus said to them, Therefore every scribe instructing concerning the kingdom of heaven, right? they were studying this, seeing what the scriptures were foretelling about it, it says, He is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. So I think a lot of times I would kind of skim over this in my Bible reading, not really thinking like, well, what does this mean? So I want you to picture a man who has a collection of treasure with dozens of valuable pieces in his treasure. There are some ancient or antique treasures, I guess you'd call them. They're well over 100 years old that he possesses. So some very old pieces of treasure, but there are also brand new pieces such as, uh, you know, new coins that are fresh and vibrant and fresh off the press, I guess you'd say. Perhaps the man shows for you an antique gun from his treasure or a coin that has been passed down for many, many years. And you look at it and you say, wow, this is some valuable stuff. And this is an old piece of treasure. You might say it's vintage. And maybe he will show you out from his old treasures. He'll show you something new, like a, a brand new polished piece of gold that he got. So, you know, pieces of treasure that are old and pieces of treasure that are new. Many believe this part of the parable to be a reference to uh, portions of both the New and Old Testaments. Okay, that the child of God inside the kingdom is enriched by each and every day. So when we study and we, we read, Right, when you enter this kingdom, you start to learn and you're enriched by this treasure and these hidden gems of wisdom that are both new and old. Right, uh, stories that are just about as ancient as the world itself, some of these stories and some of these accounts. You, know, you also come across uh, gems of wisdom that are a bit newer than the others. Some were given at the time of Christ and we learn about uh, things that were 2,000 years ago. So that's sort of what Jesus, I believe, was getting at here. You know, you go and study, you know, the poetry in the book of Job, one of the oldest books in the Bible. There's Genesis, of course, but around the time of Genesis is also Job. Or you look at the writings of Moses. You go back and read about the faithful life of King David, who was a man after God's own heart, or Joseph's faithfulness in Egypt, or when Moses led the children of Israel uh, out of Egypt. From, their, from captivity. So many of these valuable pieces of information have been passed down longer than the others. Some of the treasures that we get to be enriched by are older than the rest. So you know, consider that even the apostles of Jesus grew up reading the writings of Moses. They grew up reading Job and about the life of David. But when Jesus came in the first century and the Holy Spirit guided the apostles into revealing these new treasures about the gospel and the revealed gospel, mankind who would enter this kingdom would not only access the old treasure anymore, but they would have access to the new. You know, each night uh, I get to sit down before bed, uh, and as many of you probably do at different times of your day, and I, I personally read three chapters uh, from my Bible each night. It's kind of part of my schedule. And sometimes I read my three chapters from the New Testament. Uh, sometimes I read my three chapters from the Old. Just kind of go back and forth. And I just sit there and I'll meditate on these old writings and sifting through the valuable treasures of God's Word. And you know, some of this truth was written down around the time of Christ and in the first century. Some of it was written over a thousand years before the time of Jesus Christ and farther back after it was written. So in the kingdom, you will enjoy the riches of God's word as part of this kingdom, both new and old. Uh, and in his law, we will meditate day and night and we'll be enriched by this. Number 27 about this kingdom. Uh, it, the Bible says that it would be built by Jesus and the gates of Hades would not prevail against it, Matthew 16, 18. So Jesus said he would build it upon the Father's command, and Jesus said, if you're part of it, death and Hades will not have the victory over you. 
Now, if you become part of this kingdom, you will win against death. And that's an awesome promise, isn't it? Uh, you know, John 11, verse 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. All right, so that's the hope. That's what's so awesome about this great kingdom. The Bible teaches that Hades is the waiting place where all departed spirits go after death. Jesus demonstrated power over this uh, holding place, this waiting place for the dead that they don't have a body. When he himself departed from the place of the dead and returned back to his body and was resurrected, he demonstrated power over Hades. You know, what does Acts chapter 2 and verse 27 say about Jesus' stay in Hades? He was there briefly, right? The land of departed spirits held Jesus for a little while. Well, his body was in the tomb, his spirit was in Hades, but Jesus said in this prophecy, and uh, Peter quoted it, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. And we know it was talking about Jesus, Peter revealed. So Jesus demonstrated that he has the power and he demonstrated how, if you're part of his kingdom, you will overcome, he will overcome your death. And you will come back to life again, even if you die. All right, so that is you, that's what you gain by getting to be part of this kingdom. Hades will not have the victory over you. Job chapter 14 and verse 14 says, If a man dies, shall he live again? You know, Jesus gives the answer to the question. When he says, he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. So will a man live again? Yes, he will. And in the kingdom of God, he will. So jump inside this kingdom, and Hades will not own the victory over you. All right, death and Hades will not have the last laugh for those in this room, the citizens of this kingdom, because Jesus said he will overcome it, and he proved by being the first fruits of those who would rise from the dead, he said, I'll, I'll show you how, what's going to happen. And then it's going to happen to all the dead in the last day. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 54 says about the resurrection day, it says, Then shall be brought to pass the saying which is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. That hasn't happened yet, by the way. Uh, it's, been, it's been ready to happen, right? But it hasn't fully happened. It says, O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? And so all the dead who are in Hades will be brought to life again. And then the righteous, the Bible says, who have rested in paradise will be delivered to their permanent home where they will never die again. And then those of us who have not died, if we're here when the Lord comes back, we get to go to this place where we'll never die. And you know, Hades, the gates of Hades will not prevail, will not win against this kingdom. You know, and so the whole world's scared of death. We don't like death. Even those in the kingdom don't like death. But the Bible says, get part of that kingdom. Open, open up, get into the doors of that kingdom, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Number 28, with this kingdom, the Bible says its keys would be given to the apostles who would open the kingdom and administer, and administer heaven's mandates, Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19. So the closest followers who walked with Jesus, the apostles, would be given the privilege of uh, officially opening up this kingdom. We talked about last week, the day of Pentecost, he o that was opened up so that people could enter in. So you know, Jesus said to Peter with the other 11 apostles, he said, now I will give you, so first of all, I'm going to build my church. I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will have already been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will have already been loosed in heaven. Right? You're going to be administering heaven's mandates. So the apostles would help deliver the finished message of the kingdom, the gospel. Uh, souls would learn exactly how to be added to it, of which we know exactly how to be added to it. They would learn how to dwell in it. And these great keys would open up the door for everybody so that anybody could enter into it. Number 29, the Bible says the greatest in the kingdom are those with the greatest humility. This is a really important one. Matthew 18, verses 1 through 4, it says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, 
who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, right? Jesus was coming to establish this kingdom, and they're saying, well, well who, who's the top notch? How do you get to the highest up in the kingdom that you can possibly get? I want to do that. Because they didn't know much about the kingdom. So that is, who will be the greatest in this kingdom once it is established? Well, verse 2, it says, Then Jesus, upon this question being asked, called the little child to him. He set him in the midst of them, and he said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. So Jesus is talking about humility, the foundation of humble people and humility in the kingdom. And it's kind of like we talked about last week, how you know the poor in spirit, the Bible says, are the ones who will be brought into the kingdom of heaven. Only the poor in spirit, the meek. Uh, only those who lay down their pride, who aren't self-righteous and think that they're all important and esteem others as higher up than themselves. If you will humble yourself beneath the people of this world and beneath God, not being proud, will be found faithful, being, get to be part of the kingdom. You will get to go to heaven if we have this attitude. You cannot get into heaven without this attitude. Only those who will lower themselves beneath their fellow man and serve them will be counted worthy of faithfulness. You know, if you or I have a heart of constantly trying to be seen as great in this world and we want the praise of men, then our hearts are not right for the kingdom. We won't enter in. You know, Jesus said, no, lay down all your pride. You are no better than any other person. You're not worthy. Lay down your power-hungry mind and do not seek for others to serve you, but I want you to be a kingdom seeking to serve others. And so it's kind of the opposite of what they thought this kingdom would be. It's a kingdom of servants for a king. So esteem everybody, esteem them as greater than yourself, Philippians 3, or 2 and verse 3. Uh, number 30, a soul cannot enter it unless they are converted and become as little children. That's the part we just read. So one thing that we learn about this kingdom is that it cannot truly be entered unless you fundamentally make a change in yourself. Right? It says unless you are converted, that's the word changed, unless you're different and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So we must become like a little child in the sense that a little child is pure. We must become like a little child in the sense that a little child does not hold grudges. We must become like a little child in the sense that a little child does not pursue evil. We must become like a little child in the sense that a little child is quick to forgive. And they're not arrogant in heart. Have you met a little child that thinks he's better than everybody else? Pride does not reside in a young child. So there are many probably more that we could list about you know wholesome attributes of a young child who hasn't learned arrogance, who hasn't learned evil yet, and they're just pure. They're innocent. He said, you must make yourself like that again and put off your wickedness, put off your pride, and we must seek to replicate this. And adults need to lower themselves as children in this sense if they want to be pleasing to the Father and enter this kingdom. You know, it's funny that the world tells us today just the opposite, really, doesn't it? Of the true message of the gospel. Now, the world tells us, you know, you don't let anyone in this world try to change you. Right? You are perfect being exactly who you are right now. Don't change. Don't change who you are. If the world doesn't accept you as you are now, then the problem lies with them. It's not with you. You know, the gospel says just the opposite, doesn't it? Because the gospel says, no, the problem is you. The problem is me. Because my heart chases wickedness and I pursue many sins. And I'm the problem of this world. You're the problem of this world. And when we violate God's laws. But if you want to enter this kingdom and be part of what we're talking about and make this world a better place, by the way, you must repent of your sins 
against God's laws and be changed. Make a change of mind. That means you must have a drastic conversion of lifestyle, that you're going to be different, choosing to be different than you were before. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19 says, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. That kingdom calls for members. This kingdom calls for members who are changed from the way that they were before they entered. Uh, If you won't leave sin behind, if you won't start thinking the way God wants you to think, if you refuse to be pure, then you cannot enter into this kingdom if you aren't trying to be changed like Jesus. We're trying to uh, form fit the mold that Jesus left us, trying to be like him. So the door of entrance of this kingdom is conditional upon having a repentance. Uh, Jesus said to the woman who had previously been caught in adultery, he said to her, go and sin no more. I'm giving you a second chance. Just go seek not to sin. You know, the, the kingdom is a kingdom of changed people. It's a kingdom of penitent people who actually pursue a change of life. Uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 17 says, But God be thanked that though you were, note the past tense, you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Verse 19, he says, For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness before, and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. So what a, what a kingdom that we become part of. Uh, it's a group that is pursuing a very high calling that God has laid before us. Yeah, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26 says, Christ also loved the church, that's us, and he gave himself for her that he might sanctify, set her apart, and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So the kingdom that we're part of is holy. That's a good word to describe what we're part of. And by the way, do you remember our diagram of the tabernacle? The church, is, which is represented by the first compartment, is represented by what name in the Old Testament? It's the holy place. Right? If you won't be holy, then you cannot be counted worthy in God's eyes of being found in the holy place spiritually. Right? So that's important to understand. If, if you aren't found dwelling in the holy place, then you won't be dwelling in the most holy place after your death. There's no other way to the most holy place except you go first through the holy place, which is the church. The Bible says, But as he who called you is holy, so you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. 1 Peter chapter 1, 15 and 16. So the word holy means to be undefiled by sin. It's pure. It's purity. That's what we're calling for. You know, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So it indicates if we're not pure, we won't see God. Matthew 5 and verse 8. Number 31. Uh, this kingdom can be compared to a king who forgave his servant and then expected his servant to forgive his own fellow servant. Matthew chapter 18, verse 23. The Bible says, Then Peter came, and, uh, came to Jesus and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. 
Bible says, Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. The Bible says in verse 28, But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, which if you study the two comparisons, the two amounts, it's far less than what he owed the king. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not. But he went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. Jesus ends the parable by saying, So my heavenly Father will also do to each of you from his heart if he does not forgive his brother his trespasses. All right, so to, to be in this kingdom, we must realize that we ourselves have been released. If you enter the kingdom, you've been released from a great debt before our God and Father of your sins. You did not deserve, need, none of us deserve the prize of heaven that he's laying down of forgiveness of sins. And we must consider that when others ask us for forgiveness. All right, the type of person that Jesus mentioned in the parable is not going to make it into the eternal dwelling place with God, not by any means. All right, so because he had no compassion on his fellow man, even after God had so much compassion with him. And so that's what Jesus is looking at. Because you know, if we are not willing to have compassion, then our God will rightfully take away his compassion that he had on us. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 14, Jesus says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. Number 32. Uh, the rich in this kingdom near, uh, find it near, the rich find this kingdom nearly impossible to enter. Matthew chapter 19, verses 23 through 24. So this is a concept that we study up here quite often. Uh, the rich and the wealthy in this life. And that is really those who trust in their riches in this life cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So this is a, list, a, a lesson that Christians in America, particularly us in this room, we really need to take note of and be reminded of this frequently. Uh, if you are to be found faithful, and if I'm able to be found faithful in God's holy place as we await our death, we must not have an unrighteous relationship with our money. And that's very important. The Bible says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. First Timothy 6 and verse 10. Verse 9 of that chapter says, But those who desire to be rich... By the way, do, do we desire to be physically rich? It says, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. The verse uh, that we're looking at in Matthew 19 says, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man. You could plug in, it is hard for Americans to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. You know, heaven sends this all-important warning about something that is going to deter so many souls from entering heaven. And that's their riches. That's our things and our material objects. You know, in the parable of the soils, you remember what choked out the plant from being able to flourish and thrive that God wanted to, to be planted. Matthew 13, 22 says, Now he who received seed among thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches 
choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. And that's America. You know, we talk about how unfertile the soil is here and how hard it is to build up the kingdom and how, how hard it is really to focus on the kingdom because we're distracted by so many riches. You know, when we trust in our riches rather than trusting in God, we cannot please him. You know, when we start to chase riches and focus more on gaining riches than we do on gaining souls into the kingdom, Yes, we we got to work to support ourselves financially and our, our families. But those who desire to be rich, the Bible says, fall into a snare. Uh, scripture says, you know, in all things, we must learn to be content wherever we're at. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11. You know, whether we have a big house or a small house, a big bank account or a small bank account, we must not busy our lives serving the dollar. Because Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. Right? For he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. Then he says, you cannot love, you cannot serve God and mammon, which that word means wealth, money, riches. You can't serve the dollar and God at the same time. Scriptures also tell us uh, that we must be generous givers. We talked about that this morning. Uh, not greedy, not stingy not lovers of our money, holding to it. If we withhold our goods from others, and if we hold it to ourselves, not willing to share it, uh, it might just mean our money is too important to us. You know, an, an attachment to our money and our possessions can condemn our very souls. And it can disqualify us from being found worthy of heaven. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, and verse 17, uh, Paul says to the preacher Timothy, and listen to what he says to the rich. He says, command those who are rich. So basically he's talking to us in America, right? He says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. He says, let them do good, that they may, may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come. Right? Not storing up here, but storing up there, that they may lay hold of eternal life. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19, Jesus said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on the earth, but rather lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Right? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So one interesting thing that we find out about God's pure kingdom is that it does not even hold one soul in it that will make it to heaven who serves riches on the earth instead of serving God. Not one person is going to make it to heaven who serves riches instead of their God. Because we can't have two masters. So I fear that many Americans who attempt to follow Jesus Christ will be tricked by the devil by this very thing. You know, we are not ignorant to his devices, the Bible says. We in this country have so many riches, so many blessings. And it is, it, this is a temptation for all of us to trust in our bank accounts, to carry us from day to day and how much money we have and how many possessions, rather than simply trusting in God providing for us. Uh, the kingdom that God set up is not for the money hungry of this world. It is for those who learn to be content with what they have and trusting in God. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Don't worry about your money. And it's a hard thing to do. Number 33. The Bible says, People of all different ages will enter this kingdom and receive the same reward. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 1. So we're talking here about the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Uh, Jesus compares himself to a landowner hiring workers for the day. Uh, and if you remember the parable, the owner hires several different workers all at different times of the day. He goes out very early and he hires some at 6 a.m., some at 9 a.m. Then you get through the heat of the day, he hires more at 3 p.m. And then he hires some almost at the close of the work day. At 5 p.m., he hires some for the last hour. And of course, we know the story, the workers who were hired in the morning were furious when the workers hired at 5 p.m. received the same wage as they who had worked through the heat of the day. 
But the message of the parables uh, seems to be dealing with different ages entering the kingdom at different times in their lives and still getting to inherit the same reward of heaven. But you see, it doesn't matter if a sinner is called into God's kingdom at age 20, at age 50, or even 99 years old. If there is still life in a body, you are still going to get to go to heaven if you repent and obey the gospel. You know, someone who labored many years for the Lord while they were young and they, they quote, endured the heat of the day and they would serve God their whole life, they'll say, well, that, you know, that's not fair that a man who repented at age 99 is going to get the reward of heaven, the same heaven that I'm going to get, you know, when I became a Christian at, you know, 14 years old or 20 years old. But the master in the parable said to that criticism, he says, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for this reward? All right, take what, you, uh, t- take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? All right, God says, if I wish to forgive an elderly person who repents and is baptized at their deathbed, and then you both get to end up going to heaven after this is all over, I have done you no wrong by letting this man enter in. I think that's a great message about the kingdom. You know, the point is, the kingdom is open up to all souls as long as there's still life in your veins. That's the message of the whole world. Right? And the other thing that we need to think about if we're, quote, young, well, you're not promised tomorrow. And you might say, well, I'll be, I'll be this man, and I'll come in right at the last minute, live for the devil my whole life. Well, you could die in a car accident tonight. Jesus could come back. So it's the same for everybody. It really is. It's whenever you come to you enter into the kingdom, God says, you will get the reward of heaven. You know, some might become members of the church of Christ when they're young. Others might make that noble decision when they're very old. But God will give the same reward. You know, some might say, well, you know, I'm worried after all the sins of my youth. Maybe someone who is older and was, would consider obeying the gospel. They say, you know, I don't think God could possibly forgive this pile of sin that I have committed over so many years of wickedness. But the parable says, yeah, you will. Doesn't matter how long you've been sinning. And you'll receive the reward too, just like those who entered early on in life. If you will, repent. And I think that's a very comforting concept to many people in this world. They say, I don't think I'm worthy. Well, none of us are worthy. It doesn't matter. That is never too late for a soul willing to be converted to Christ to enter in. So, uh, you know, what's so cool about this kingdom that is opened up to anybody? The Bible says, let all who thirst take from the water of life freely. You can have it. It's yours. Jesus said, uh, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So we'll stop there tonight on our list about the kingdom, which is the Church of Christ. Uh, those, those of us who are a part of it, we thank God continually about what we have access to and the reward that awaits us. We're so excited to get to go and be with God in the second part of this kingdom. And for those who might be listening uh, online who are not part of the kingdom yet, uh, we extend the invitation to you this evening. The Bible teaches in order to enter into the kingdom, you've got to just obey the gospel and remain faithful to it the rest of your life. The Bible says to do that, you just got to hear what the message says about Jesus paying for the sins of the world. You can tap into that by believing that message about the Son of God, repenting, we talked about tonight, confessing Christ before men. It's like the, the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Don't hold the faith back, confess it. And lastly, the Bible says in order for you to enter in, you're baptized into Christ. You're baptized into the kingdom, the final step. And the Bible says you are in. The Bible says then once you're in, you got to stay in and remain faithful until the day you die. You'll cross through the veil and be in the presence of the Father. So if, if anybody needs to do that, uh, the invitation is open. And if any souls who are not ready to pass through that veil this very evening, if you're not ready, make sure you repent. Come forward as we stand and as we sing.